Yeah, so this is a talk about the tunneling magnetoresistance resistance effect uh, in spectronic devices. I'm calling conventional versus modern approaches because um, I my intention here is to compare uh, the usual way of attaining tunneling magnetoresistance resistance effect and large tunneling magnetoresistance resistance effect in magnetic tunnel junction devices in a textbook manner, the way people used to do. And the modern approaches, which are new approaches, which are arising because we are discovering new material systems with very interesting electronic properties. So I would like to contrast these two approaches to uh, to talk about the tunneling magnetic resistance effect. Okay. And this talk is a tutorial-like talk. So here in Minnesota, sometimes we have a summer school. And this is a talk that I like to give to the students. I think it's a kind of appropriate talk. And if you know a little bit about tunneling magnetic resistance effect, I hope that you can learn a lot from this talk. And if you know a lot about it, uh, at least you're gonna get my perspective and putting uh, in context with these conventional versus modern approaches, okay? So the tunneling magnetic resistance effect is a phenomenon that takes place in magnetic tunnel junction devices which are simply a tri-layer structures made from two magnetic layers separated by a very thin latent spacer, like the one shown in the figure. So because we have two magnets and the two magnets have their own magnetizations, so there are two possible states uh, for the MTJ. The first state is when the two magnetizations are anti-aligned, which I'm calling anti-parallel configuration. So it has a resistance RAP. And the second state is, where, is when the two magnetizations are aligned. So this is what I'm calling a parallel uh, configuration, which I'm gonna, which has a resistance RP. And the main point is that the electrical resistances of these two configurations are not the same. And usually the resistance of the anti-parallel configuration is larger than the resistance of the parallel configuration. And this is precisely what the tunneling magnetic resistance effect is all about. It is the main source of this resistance uh, difference between parallel and anti-parallel configurations. So here's how it works in practice. Uh, you can switch the magnetization of one of these uh, magnetic layers by applying magnetic field. And you can do that as you measure the electrical resistance of the MTJ. So for instance, if you start at a high resistance anti-parallel configuration, you can apply sufficiently strong magnetic field and your system will transition to a low resistance parallel configuration. You can do the opposite. If you start in the low resistance parallel configuration, you can apply sufficiently strong magnetic field in the opposite direction and then your MTJ will transition to a high resistance anti-parallel configuration. Okay. So these MTJ devices are extremely important for spintronics. So uh, they have amazing applications. Uh, they can make um, amazing technological chips uh, with those uh, kind of devices. And one, one of the most prominent examples is that of MRAMs. So here's what... Uh, MRAM looks like. You have a lot of those magnetic tunnel junctions uh, in this cross point architecture. And memory, magnetic memory is made out of uh, those magnetic tunnel junctions. They offer several advantages, such as, for example, they are non volatile, so which means that information is retained even though the power is off, uh, even when the power is off. So they have amazing qualities as well. Like, for example, they have large endurance, uh, high endurances, and also they are super fast devices. And probably one of the most exciting applications of this kind of memories is that uh, in memory century computing chips. Okay, So this has been demonstrated by Samsung quite recently, uh, that you can perform, actually perform computations using this kind of memory devices as well. So this is all exciting, is a hot topic nowadays for uh, applications electronics. And in MRAMs, binary information is stored in these magnetic tunnel junctions. And you can, for instance, assign logic one to the anti-parallel configuration. 
and logic zero to the parallel configuration uh, as shown here schematically in these figures. And what makes uh, this possible is the fact that there is a gap of resistance between these two configurations. Okay. To have well-defined bits and reliable reading of these MRAMs, uh, we need to maximize this resistance gap. Uh, and this is, uh, we use, we have a figure of merit to quantify this gap, which we call the tunneling magnetic resistance ratio, which is simply resistance of parallel minus resistance of anti-parallel normalized by the resistance of parallel configuration times 100%. And there has been a lot of effort in trying to maximize this TMR ratio for applications. And of course, to maximize the TMR ratio, uh, we need to understand where it comes from, uh, what kind of material properties affect the size of this uh, tunneling magnetic resistance, resistance ratio, and et cetera. And this talk is all about that. This talk is about where the tunneling magnetic resistance ratio comes from, uh, which kind of material properties we should seek uh, in trying to optimize this figure of merit, and so on. Okay. So here's my outline. Uh, I divided my talk into three main topics. So the first one, in the first part, I'm gonna talk about the tunneling magnetic resistance effect in a basic context. And then I also am gonna talk about the, probably the most famous MTJ ever, which is the iron magnesium oxide iron MTJ. And this sets the conventional approach for the tunneling magnetic resistance effect, which is what has been uh, done in the past two decades for optimizing uh, the tunneling magnet resistance ratio. And next, I'm gonna talk about two more modern topics, uh, which is also related to the tunneling magnet resistance effect, which is the ability to generate this effect using new materials uh, and new properties that I have uh, been discovered in the past, I don't know, five years or so. So the first one is a tunnel magnetic resistance due to alter magnetism, which is a new kind of uh, magnetism, as people say. Uh, and my work, which is the tunnel magnetic resistance effect with bio metals, which is a, a new class of topological materials, which is attracting a lot of attention due to specific kind of properties we can find in them. So this is uh, my plan for today. And let's start with the basics then. I'll tell you the resistance effect in magnesium oxide based antigens. Right. So the first mention ever to the telemagnetic resistance effect dates back to 75 uh, when Julier, which was a grad student at the time, he proposed that in magnetic tunnel junction devices, you can have two states with different resistances. Uh, and he was actually able to measure that. He measured a tunneling magnetic resistance ratio of 14% at 4.2 calves in a germanium-based magnetic tunnel junction. So that was the first proposal ever of a device like this, at least uh, that has been reported or published. Okay. And his idea was the following. So let's say we have a magnetic tunnel junction. Here is just a, an example. It's not necessarily the same one that he used, but I have two iron contacts and I have an insulator in between. And for each iron contact, I can look at the density of states for each spin species within the contacts. So the blue density of states is the density of states for spin up electrons, let's say, uh, and the red one is for spin down. So when the two magnetizations are aligned, there is a perfect matching between the density of states on the opposite sides of the barrier. And that gives rise to some tunneling current. But when the two magnetizations are anti-aligned, like in this uh, uh, right figure, there is now a perfect mismatch of the density of states on the opposite sides of the barrier. And that gives rise to a distinct tunneling current. So there are two possible configurations with the distinct tunneling currents, and this is precisely what the tunneling magnetic resistance effect is all about. Okay. So that was his first proposal, uh, and he actually went beyond that 
and propose a formula for calculating how big the tunneling magnetic resistance effect would be in a given system. And here is his formula. It's called the Julier formula for the tunneling magnetic resistance ratio. Uh, it is two times PL PR uh, over one minus PL PR. PL and PR are simply the spin polarization of the ferromagnetic contacts. L and R stands for left and, uh, left and right contacts. Here, the density of states is defined in relation to the, uh, sorry, the spin polarization is defined in relation to the density of states of the contacts. So as long as you know what the density of states of the contacts look like for each spin species, uh, you can sort out what is the polarization and then you can make predictions as, uh, as far as the size of the TMR is concerned. And I would like to make uh, two predictions using this TMR formula so we can uh, have a better notion of how it works. Okay, okay so let's pick the TMR formula. And the first prediction that I would like to make is what is the recipe for attaining a giant tunneling magnet resistance effect? That is, how can I uh, set up my MTJ device in such a way that this TMR ratio is as large as possible? Okay. And that's quite simple. Uh, we just need perfectly spin polarized contacts, which means we just need contacts uh, where the polarizations are one, which is the maximum one you can get. If both are one, the denominator approaches zero, so the TMR approaches infinity. Okay, so that's the first prediction. These contacts with perfect spin polar polarizations are known as half metals. So this is a well-known prediction, and this is a true prediction of the uh, of the uh, Julier's formula for the TMR. I'm going to use this prediction later on to explain an uh, unusual feature of magnesium oxide-based MTJs. So it is important that you, you keep that in mind. Okay. Now, the second prediction I would like to make is I just would like to calculate the TMR for a typical MTJ device. So let's pick the iron insulator iron MTJ device. So all I need to know is what is the spin polarization of iron contacts? So if you search in literature, you're going to find a range of numbers, like I found uh, something between 38 and 45 percent. 38 percent is the theoretical first principles calculated uh, density of states spin polarization. And experimentally, you can find things around 44, 45 percent. So there is a range of polarization that you can utilize. And if you plug in into uh, the Julier's formula, you find that the TMR ratio for an iron-based MTJ ranges from 33% to 50%, okay? And I gotta say this prediction is wrong. This is where the Julier's formula fails. And we know that because this iron MTO, iron MTJ, it is known to be, to, to display a giant tunneling magnet resistance effect of theoretically thousands percent, okay? So one of the questions is that I would like to emphasize here is why this formula fails in describing that system specifically. Not necessarily just that system, but why it, why it fails to describe the size of this TMR. And I think one important point is to realize that there is nothing about the tunneling barrier in Julier's formula. All I have is polarization of contacts. So this formula tells me that it doesn't matter which barrier I use, I always get the same tunneling spin polar, uh, tunneling magnet resistance effect, which is wrong. Okay. And this is the point that is missing in this formula, the barrier, the electronic states in the barrier. And next, I would like to export the uh uh, the impact of the electronic states in the barrier on the tunneling magnetic resistance effect and how to fix uh, this uh, feature of uh, the Julier's formula for the tunneling magnetic resistance effect. Okay, 
So yeah, so we have to look at how electrons behave in the barrier now to make sense of uh, the large stone magnetic resistance effect in magnesium oxide, iron, MTJs. So here are the electronic structures for each component of the MTJ. Uh, the band structure of iron, we have two sets of bands, red and blue bands, which means bands for spin up and spin down electrons. I have the same for both contacts. Uh, and for the magnesium oxide, I have electronic structure that is shown here in the middle, which displays a huge energy gap, which is around five electron volts, according to some first principles calculations. And this is the main feature of an insulator. And the tunneling picture that I have in mind now is just the textbook classic uh, scattering picture for tunneling, where you have a propagating state uh, that is uh, that has a positive velocity to the right. That propagating state in the iron contact couples to the evanescent state within the barrier. And that sets the maximal amplitude of the wave function on the opposite side of the barrier and sets the maximal tunneling probability for those electron states. So here in this model, we explicitly uh, know how the electron states of the insulator can influence the tunneling, bar uh, the tunneling probability across the barrier. And that's related to the, this kappa parameter which is the penetration depth of this evanescent state. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is the picture that I have in mind right now. But the thing is, this picture is too simple to describe a real MTJ device like the one shown in the top here. And the reason why is that in real material systems, we don't have just one single evanescent state possible we can have a collection of distinct evanescent states within the barrier. And that's due to the fact that in, much, in crystalline materials, electrons occupy different orbital states. So you can have S, P, X, P, Y, P, Z orbitals. So then you can have wave functions, which are linear combinations of the, all of those orbitals. And then you can have multiple choices. So a somewhat more realistic picture of a tunneling in a real material has several different possibilities. So the first possibility, for example, is that uh, the propagating state couples to one evanescent state, which has a specific penetration depth, which is characterized by kappa one. And that gives rise to some tunneling probability. But there is also the possibility that the propagating state couples to a different evanescent state within the barrier, which is characterized by a distinct penetration depth, which is uh, given by kappa chi, okay, which is much shorter in this case, uh, just uh, to exemplify. And in this case, the tunneling probability or the wave function that reaches the other side is has a much smaller amplitude. So this is what happens in real materials. And here uh, I can I can mention a really important concept and a really important uh, feature of tunneling in real material systems, which is the fact that we always have some sort of filtering. By that I mean, so, uh, so for instance, if you focus on the first figure, the top figure, so we can see that the tunneling probability should be larger because I have a larger amplitude of the wave function reaching the other side. While in the second case where the penetration depth of the evanescent state is smaller, uh, you has an exponentially suppressed tunneling probability on the other side. So effectively, the barrier filters the tunneling states across the barrier and only leaves states uh, associated with this kappa one to tunnel through. So there is always a sort of filtering effect in a realistic system. So then let's look at how the tunneling filtering effect looks for magnesium oxide. We can actually calculate what the kappa looks for for magnesium oxide. So for instance, let's say we have a OO1 surface and we want to look at the penetration depth of those evanescent states away from that surface. So this is a complex band structure calculation to 
provide information about that for magnesium oxide. So the x-axis is the kappa value. And we can see here we have a lot of states within the gap, which are the evanescent states. And we have several possibilities. We have this first sim circle, uh, which I'm labeling delta 1. We can have another possibility, which is I'm labeling delta 5, delta 2 prime, and delta 2. Okay. And again, these are all distinct possibilities for evanescent states. And the labeling is just uh, I'm labeling set of orbitals for uh, which make up the electron states for each one of these curves. So for example, the delta one evanescent states, they are the wave function is a linear combination of S, P, Z, and D, Z three orbitals. So they have all all of them have a kind of a, a rotational symmetry by any angle in relation to the O one axis. The delta five state is an evanescent state that is made from a linear combination of PZ, PY, and other D orbitals, and the delta two are relation are linear are made from linear combination of D orbitals only. So this is just a, a way of classifying uh, what those evanescent states look like from the symmetries of their orbital content. And for magnesium oxide, for example. Uh, we can see here that at energy equals zero, which is the horizontal dashed line, the smallest possible kappa is that one corresponding to the delta one states. And it has a value that is approximately four, one over nanometers, okay? So the next one is delta five states. They have a kappa that is around eight or nine nanometers, uh, one over nanometers, followed by delta two prime and delta two. So in magnesium oxide, there is a clear progression or a clear relation between those kappas where the kappa of delta one states is the smallest possible. Okay. So the picture for MGO looks like the one shown here in this uh, cartoony picture where the evanescent penetration depth of those evanescent states of delta one electrons uh, is much larger than all the others, like for example, the delta five electrons. So then we have filtering. So if we have a wave function that couples to the delta one states of magnesium oxide, they will tunnel, tunnel through the barrier with, with a much higher tunneling probability than delta five states, for example. And this is an actual calculation showing that. So here I have the non-equilibrium electron density across uh, the tunneling junction and Different curves are different evanescent uh, state are modes which couple to different evanescent states. So, for example, uh, the red curve is the uh, modes that couple to the delta one states, and then the blue one for the delta five states, and so on. So, this calculation shows that the electron density, the non-equilibrium tunneling electron density that reaches the other side of the barrier. Uh, is pretty much only due to the to those states which couple to the delta one states of magnesium oxide. The next one is the one that couples to the delta five states, but these are ten orders of magnitude smaller than the ones that couples to the delta one states. So in this sense, we can say that magnesium oxide is a symmetry filter. It filters states which have this delta one symmetry. And these are the only states that you should take into account when you analyze tunneling or tunneling magnetic resistance effect in an iron MGO, iron MTG. Okay. So the next natural question is, what does the delta one states look like for iron? Because those are the ones that couple to the delta one states in magnesium oxide. So here's the base structure of iron. Uh, again, I have up and down spin states uh, represented by red and blue col colors. I can also label all the bands by symmetry, by delta one, delta two, delta five symmetries. And it turns out that for the delta one symmetries, these are the bands uh, which have the delta one symmetry for up and down spins. So the firm level is also shown as a horizontal solid black line. 
And what we can see from this figure is that uh, we have a perfectly speed polarized bands, delta one bands in iron. So the firm level is above the bottom of the delta one band for spin down electrons, but is below the bottom of the delta one band for spin up electrons. So that means there is no spin up electrons at all at the firm level, of, which have the delta one states at the firm level of iron. And this is a perfectly spin polarized band. So therefore, remember the prediction that I made from Julia's formula that whenever you have uh, perfectly spin polarized contacts, you can attain gigantic tunneling magnet resistance ratios. And it turns out that in iron, this is the case. And here is a calculation of how the TMR ratio in this MTJ varies with the number of magnesium oxide layers. And you can see that it as I increase the number of layers, the thickness of the insulator, the tunneling magnetic resistance ratio increases uh, very fast and can reach 1,000%. And this is all due to the fact that MGO is a symmetry filter and we have those fully, perfectly spin polarized states in iron. So this prediction was made in the 2000s by Butler. Before that, People used to use aluminum oxide, which is an amorphous insulator, as tunnel barriers. And the highest possible tunneling magnetic resistance ratio obtained at that time with aluminum oxide was around 100%. And here is actually a, a map that shows the evolution of the tunneling magnetic resistance ratio along the years uh, with different choices of materials. Uh, composing the MTG. So here, uh, the first one in 75 was Julier's uh, measure of the TMR using germanium tunneling barrier. The blue symbols and the blue solid line are the evolution of the tunneling magnetic resistance ratios in, mag uh, in magnetic tunnel junctions that have aluminum oxide tunneling barriers. And as you can see, over the years, improvement in fabrication techniques allowed uh, an improvement in tunneling magnetic resistance ratio up to 80%, at least as, uh, according to this plot. But then around the 2000s, uh, we realized this uh, gigantic tunneling magnetic resistance effect due to the symmetry filtering, filtering of magnesium oxide. And that skyrocketed the tunneling magnetic resistance ratio of magnetic tunnel junctions. And the largest value that I, um, I'm aware of at room temperature based on uh, magnesium oxide was 600%, which is shown here in this figure, and that was obtained by Ikeda in 2008. So that, that's a remarkable achievement for magnetic tunnel junctions. And this has been the approach to follow that has been followed at least for the past several years in trying to optimize the tunneling magnetic resistance effect is to find appropriate materials which couples to specific states in the barrier such as to optimize uh, this effect. So that's pretty much the conventional approach to the tunneling magnetic resistance effect. Uh, now I would like to switch to modern approaches to the tunneling magnetic resistance effect. And these approaches, they are based on the contacts mainly, not on the barrier itself. Although you can also incorporate the effects of the barrier and improve much further the tunneling magnetic resistance in these systems. So the first modern approach for uh, the tunneling magnetic resistance effect that I would like to mention is due to alter magnetism, which is a new kind of anti-ferromagnetism that has been proposed a few years ago. So let me just mention briefly what is ultramagnetism so you have a reference. So ferromagnetism is when all these things align in a material due to exchange interactions. So usually in a ferromagnet, all the spins are aligned like this. And 
a consequence is that in is that electronic structure we have a spin splitting, like in the case of iron, where spin up bands and spin down bands are separated in energy due to the exchange field. So this is probably one of the most famous form of magnetism ever. But there are other forms of magnetisms as well, such as the antiferromagnetism. Antiferromagnetism, uh, here I'm referring to specifically to collinear antiferromagnetism. And this is a magnetic ordering where spins tend to anti-align uh, within uh, neighboring sites in your atomic lattice. So for instance, the red sites I have spin down, while in the blue sites I have spin up. And these antiferromagnets, there are specific symmetries which constrain the kind of electronic structure you can have. So for instance, the most common symmetry in, anti in collinear antiferromagnets is a combination of translation and inversion symmetry. So inversion symmetry, you're gonna flip the spins uh, and a translation is gonna take the blue sides to the red sides. So everything comes back to the original uh, configuration. And because of these symmetries, and because of the fact that we have anti-aligned spins, the electronic structure of typical collinear antiferromagnets uh, is it doesn't display any spin polarization at all. So up spins and down spin bands they are perfectly on top of each other, uh, such as the one shown here in this figure. And this is a manifestation of the fact that we have net zero magnetic moment in this kind of systems. So this is what antiferromagnetism is in a basic form. But quite recently, it was realized that there are subclasses of antiferromagnetism, uh, antiferromagnetic states. And one of them is what people are calling alter magnetism. So alter magnets are antiferromagnets in the sense that they have uh, anti-aligned spins in neighboring sites. However, the symmetries of these kind of systems are not just simple translation and, uh, plus uh, uh, inversion symmetries, but actually you have to add some mirror symmetries or some rotations uh, for the system. So it's, uh, to simply put, alter, magnet, alter magnets are collinear antiferromagnets with less symmetry in some sense. And this lack of symmetry is due to the fact that the atomic environment around those uh, magnetic sites is they have different symmetries, which is uh, represented by these loss angles, which have uh, different orientations for different sites. And one consequence of that is Again, this is still antiferromagnet, so it doesn't have a net magnetic moment. But because I have broken symmetries, so the band structure for each spin sector is allowed to split in momentum space. So this is what the band structure of alter magnets look like. And the bands are split in such a way that if you sum the full magnetic moment of electrons, you still get zero magnetic moment. So in some sectors of your momentum space, you're gonna have, let's say a positive spin splitting, but it, this is always compensated by a negative spin splitting in other sectors of your momentum space. So the Fermi surface looks like this. So ruthenium oxide is the most famous alter magnet that has been proposed as far as I know. Uh, so here's what a crystal structure of ruthenium oxide looks like. Blue atoms are ruthenium atoms. Yellow atoms are oxygen atoms. And you can see here in this picture that uh, the magnetic moments, they are centered around the ruthenium atoms and they're opposite in these different atomic sites. What makes ruthenium oxide ultra magnet is the fact that oxygen environment around those atomic sites are not the same, which breaks the, uh, the translation per plus uh, inversion symmetry of the system, turning uh, it into an ultra magnet. So here's a real uh, electronic structure calculation for that system. Uh, so we can see that uh, this is a, a metal, first and foremost. 
So this is an antiferromagnetic or ultramagnetic metal. Uh, along most of the Berlin zone paths, uh, I only see one band, the blue band, which means that the two spin bands are on top of each other. But there are specific paths in the Berlin zone that I have a spin splitting of those spin bands. So for example, uh, from uh, the path from M to gamma, I can see spin splittings uh, very explicitly. So this is an uh, ultra magnet, at least in theory. Okay, so there's a controversy about uh, the experimental realization of that. But anyways, at least in theory, this is an ultra magnet. So yeah, in the ultra magnet, so this is a, a better way to visualize uh, those spin splitted states. So here, let's say, is uh, one specific configuration of ruthenium oxide where the nail vector, which is the magnetic moment of ace ruthenium in A sites, minus the magnetic moment of ruthenium atoms in the B sites, uh, look like. And if, let's say, my nail vector is pointing up, uh, which means I have this specific configuration, this is what the spin density of states for ruthenium oxide looks like in the kx ky plane. Red colors means spin up, and blue colors mean spin down along this direction. So you can see that uh, for every blue spot, you have a red spot. So the net magnetization is zero if you sum everything. But at specific k points, you have a magnetic, mo a magnetic moment. So electrons, let's say, with this specific a momentum, they have spin up, and electrons with sp the specific momentum, they have spin down. Now if you switch the nail vector, like this, so now you're gonna switch the magnetic moments around each ruthenium atom, but because the symmetries are broken, uh, at least in relation to the conventional anti magnet, so you have to reflect the uh, spin polarization in momentum space to accommodate that symmetry breaking. And in that case, what happens is that all these spins flip in momentum space. So what was a, blue, a red region before be now becomes a red, a blue region and vice versa. So this is a very unique feature of alter magnets that has been proposed to give rise to the tunneling magnet resistance effect, although you don't have a net magnetization this system. And the idea goes as follows. So let's say we have a magnetic tunnel junction that is made from ruthenium oxide contacts, and I have a titanium oxide barrier, which is an insulator. Uh, in the ruthenium oxide, if the two nail vectors are aligned like this, uh, there's a perfect matching between the momentum space spin polarization throughout the whole Berlin zone on opposite sides of the barrier. So now I can have, for example, electrons with specific momentum with up spins uh, tunneling to states with the same momentum on the opposite side of the barrier with the same spin. So that's an allowed process. I can have the same on all other portions of the Berlin zone as shown here and here. So that gives rise to a certain tunneling current across the system. Now, if I have a anti-parallel configuration where I switch the nail vector of the right ruthenium oxide, now I have to flip all the spins for each momentum uh, on the right barrier. So now I have a situation where, for instance, if an electron at this specific momentum with spin with the red spin wants to tunnel through the barrier. So there's no other option other than to occupy this specific state with the same momentum. But that's not allowed because they spin now, now they spin is not the same for that specific state. And the same thing happens here if you are electrons initially uh, with a blue spin. It is the only possibility is that it can tunnel through and occupy state in the red spin, which is impossible because that's a uh, opposite spin state. So these processes are forbidden, and therefore you have less current in this second configuration. And again, you have two states 
uh, which have different currents. So that's pretty much uh, what the tunneling magnetic resistance effect is all about. But here, the what plays an important role is not the total polarization of the contacts, but is the polarization at each momentum for each contact. So that was a very nice concept. And that's an incredible achievement, I would say, at least theoretically so far, because you can have tunneling magnetic resistance with no spin currents passing through your system at all. And antiferromagnets are also uh, very prominent systems for spintronics because they display super fast magnetization dynamics and they don't have a net magnetic moment in the system. Okay. So here's the calculation for the TMR, how big it is. Uh, so the first calculation shows how the transmission varies with uh, the firm level of the system. And as you can see, the transmission for a parallel configuration, which is the red symbols, they are not the same as the transmission for the anti-parallel configuration, which are the little symbols. And specifically, at if the firm level is positive or if the energy is positive, the difference is larger. So you should have a larger tunneling magnetic resistance effect at positive doping, let's say, electron doping. And this is precisely what the second plot shows. It shows the tunneling magnetic resistance effect you should expect for the system as a function of doping. And we can see here that at the firm level and above the firm level, you should have, you should expect a tunneling magnetic resistance of at least 500% for this kind of material, which is quite uh, substantial. Uh, but it can be further improved if you, uh, if you get different barriers and see uh, and make the same line of reasoning that uh, we did in the case of iron before, for example engineer this TMR to be larger by appropriate choice of barrier, which hasn't been done yet. Okay. So that summarizes uh, the first modern approach to the tunneling magnetic resistance effect. Uh, again, the focus now is the contacts itself and the novel spin properties of those contacts instead of how the barrier filter states. Okay. So the second and last one that I would like to mention uh, was an idea that I proposed a few years ago, which is to utilize the unique spin states in magnetic biosemimetals to attain the tunneling magnetic resistance effect as well. So first, let me introduce what a biosemimetal is. And this is uh, probably, I think, one of the ways that I like the most to introduce it. So, you know, nowadays in condensed matter physics, we talk about a lot about insulators and topological insulators. So a normal insulator is just a system which has an energy gap, a separated conduction and valence states, and the valence states are fully occupied. A topological insulator is like that as well. It's also an insulator. But the wave function of the ground state, it has a special property which is constrained by the topology of the system. And to that property, we ascribe a topological invariant to tell uh, the way the wave function looks like for that specific system. So for example, we can imagine an evolution between a normal insulator and a topological insulator, and we can keep track of that topological invariant that tells us about the phase we have. So and here's a parameter that guides you through the evolution to the transition. And M is typically the strength of the spin orbit traction in the system. So if you start with a trivial insulator, which has a topological invariant of zero, uh, usually you have to invert the bands. You have to pass through a region where there is no gap at all. Uh, and beyond that, the gap is inverted. And that signifies a transition to a topological insulating phase, such that the topological invariant is now one. So this is what happens if you have a topological insulator transition in systems which are not magnetic and which have inversion symmetry. If either one of those symmetries are broken, like for example, if you have magnetism, the transition is not exactly the same. The transition looks like this actually. 
So now during the transition point where we have this semi-metallic state, I cannot have just one single crossing point. I must have at least two crossing points due to the fact that I have reduced symmetry. And in that case, I have a full intermediate state between the trivial insulator and the topological insulator. And this intermediate state is a semi-metal because I have crossing points. I don't have a gap and I have low density of states. And this is precisely what we call a biosemi metal. So biosemi metal is a state, it's a semi-metallic state that happens at the transition between trivial and topological insulating states when you have either broken version or broken time versus symmetry. And again, the main feature of this biosemi metal state is that we have these crossing points in this spectrum around the perm level. So here is a typical theoretically predicted system that hosts a biophase. It's a ropium cadmium arsenide in its ferromagnetic phase. And here's what its spectrum looks like. So we can clearly see I have two crossing points. So here I'm zooming in, uh, where I have uh, where the conduction valence bands they cross linearly around these points. And this linear crossing is pretty much what defines the biophysics of this system. Electrons with linear crossings, uh, they are relativistic electrons, so they have specific relativistic properties that normal quadratic dispersing electrons don't have. And one of them is the fact that it has a well-defined chirality. So, a so uh, and the chirality translates into how the spin states of those electrons look like in momentum space. So a, a good example of a biosemi metal is that of tantalum arsenide. So this is not a magnetic biosemi metal, it is an inversion broken biosemi metal. But uh, yeah, it's good to emphasize because this is probably one of the most well-studied biosemi metals in literature. And in these figures, I'm showing the electronic structure of that system. Uh, and I, the colors represent the spin. So the top figure shows the calculated band structure. And as you can see here, because the system is non-magnetic, but it's forced to have a spin texture due to the fact that we have these crossing points in the spectrum as shown here. So uh, if you initially have a spin up state, which is, or a spin down state, which is the red color. So as you go along, the Brillouin zone following that specific band, uh, the spin state of that specific band will change to blue, which is going to change to spin up. So you have a texture of spin for those biosemi metals in spins uh, in the momentum space. Okay. So this has actually been measured by uh, circular dichroism ARPIS. So this is uh, what this uh, lower figure shows. You can see that. Uh, you have this transition from the up spins to the down spin regions around these bio points. And the right figure is an illustration of what the spin texture at the firm surface of bio metals look like. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see here, but I have uh, this circular or this spherical firm surface, uh, and all these spins are pointing inwards, uh, at least to some extent, in this kind of system. So here's a better uh, figure to visualize that. So I have the two value nodes. Uh, so one has describes electron states with positive chirality, which means that spin and momentum are aligned. And the second value node describes electron states, they support electron states with negative chirality, which means that the spins and momentum are anti-aligned. Okay. So if you have a firm level, let's say right here, so you're going to have firm surfaces, which are shown in this figure. And the arrows represent the spin states for each firm surface possible that you can get along the conduction band for the bias and the metal. Um, the two uh, points where the spin texture diverges and converges, these are precisely the bio node location. So for instance, around this bio node, which has a positive uh, blue color here, which means a positive chirality, uh, we see that the spin texture is radial and points out. 
for each momenta around this Fermi surface. For the second vial node, which has uh, a vi uh, which has a topological charge which is negative, represented by red. So I also have a radial spin texture, but all these spins they point in in that case, which is a manifestation of the negative chirality of that system. So this is a, a better depiction of the spin texture of a biosemimetal. Of course, this is just a model calculation, but as sufficiently close, uh, if you are in sufficiently close in energy to the bio point, that's what you should get. And moreover, this is the spin texture when you have a magnetic biosemimetal with a magnetization that is pointing to the right. Okay. If you switch the magnetization of this biosemimetal, let's say to the left, the full spin texture has to change as well. But because spin texture is connected to the chirality of the bio nodes, that means that the chiralities of these bio nodes, they must switch as well. So as you switch the magnetization of a magnetic biosemi metal, you go from a configuration like this, where the positive chirality fermions are to the left and negative chirality fermions to the right, to a configurations, to a second configuration where the negative chirality biofermions are to the left and positive chirality biofermions are to the right. So you can change the chirality of these biofermions through the magnetization. And that's something that Tony is calling a uh, chirality magnetization locking. Now, the chirality magnetization locking gives rise to a tunneling magnet resistance mechanism in magnetic tunnel junctions made from bias metals. And here is how it goes. So let's say you have a bias metal which, which is doped. So here's the firm level is above the bio points. Uh, in that situation, you're going to have two Fermi surfaces, which are RG joint in momentum space with opposite chiralities. So this is the plus and minus Fermi surface representing right-handed and left-handed biofermions. Okay. And the arrows are the spin texture associated with those Fermi surfaces. Now, if you have a magnetic tunnel junction made from these bias and metals in the parallel configuration, uh, the two Fermi surfaces with the same chirality are aligned on opposite sides of the barrier. So then electrons, they can tunnel through the barrier while conserving momentum and chirality. And this gives rise to a transmission probability or to a tunneling current that depends exponentially on the barrier thickness, but it's finite. Okay. Now, if you switch the magnetization of the right bias in the metal, uh, you're going to switch the chiralities as well. So now if you take into account the tunneling, let's say from uh, the left to the right electrodes for the biosemi metals, which have initially a positive chirality, they have to occupy states with negative chirality on opposite sides of the barrier. And they cannot do that because opposite chirality chiralities are orthogonal. So there's no other option, so they have to entirely reflect. And that gives rise to a huge resistance in your system. So this mechanism of flipping the chirality with magnetization gives rise to a, a, a tunneling magnet resistance effect in these kind of systems. And we can actually perform calculations to show that. So I've done, uh, for, uh, not first principles, but uh, a quantum transport calculations based on a model of a biosemi metal uh, on an MTJ device. And the first MTJ device that I consider is an MTJ made from uh, two biosemi metals with uh, an arbitrary insulator in the middle. And here I'm considering the case where the two magnetizations are in plane. By in plane, I mean at the interface plane. And I'm allowing the magnetization of the right magnet, magnetic biosemi metal to rotate around. And I'm calculating how the conductance of this MTJ varies with that angle theta r. This is what I get. I get that the conductance 
uh, is initially uh, round one. Of course, this is log scale, and this is uh, 10 to minus 7 A squared over H units. So it begins at a specific finite value. But as I rotate the magnetization all the way down to 180 degrees, which means the anti-parallel configuration, I notice that the tunnel magnetic the conductance, it drops substantially by several orders of magnitude all the way down to the anti-parallel configuration. And this is uh, gives rise to a huge tunnel magnetic resistance effect for that specific bio MTJ with in-plane magnetizations. I've also done calculations for other specific configurations, such as the case where the magnetizations are out of plane. So I have a perpendicular anisotropy in this case. And I can reproduce the same line of reasoning where I fix the magnetization of the left biotomic metal and investigate how the conductance changes as I rotate the magnetization of the biotomic metal around in the XY plane here, according to my definitions. And what I see is the conductance also changes, varies from parallel to interparallel configuration, but the difference is not that substantial. Okay. So therefore, only in the in-plane biosimic metal MTJ is where I should expect a huge tunneling magnetic resistance effect of several orders of magnitude. And the reason why we have such a radical uh, difference in this case is precisely because of the chirality of the biosimic metals and is associated with being textured as I explained in the previous slides. So in the in-plane case, uh, I have two uh, firmer surfaces which have uh, different chiralities and they project into different locations in the in-plane Brillon zone. So for each momenta, in-plane momenta, of my tunneling electrons, I can have a well-defined chirality. Okay. So then I should expect uh, the mechanism that I explained in the previous slide to work, and that's uh, the reason why we have such a radical uh, difference between those resistances in parallel and interparallel. But when my magnetization is out of plane, like here in this bottom case, the two Fermi surfaces with opposite chirality they project onto the same spot in momentum space. So tunneling states in this configuration, they are coherent superposition of positive and negative chiralities. So they don't have well-defined chirality uh, in the tunneling. And therefore, the mechanism that I applied, that I explained previously, doesn't work. And that's the reason why we don't see a substantial drop in conductance in the anti-parallel configuration. So the uh, TMR ratio that I calculated uh, using some uh, first principles parameters from known biosimic metals was around 10,000%, which is pretty substantial. And it really only depends on the fact on the kind of broadening or uh, thermal averaging that I have in my system. It could be much higher than that. But there are a few challenges to realize that. That was just a theoretical proposal. So now if we want to realize that, uh, we need to be aware of this problem of ideal biosimic metals. So an ideal biosimic metal is a biosimic metal which has only those crossing bands around the firm level, like this European cardinal arsenide. So this system, again, it was a, a first principles calculations prediction. But quite recently, it has been demonstrated experimentally that this system is actually a, ferma a magnetic semiconductor. It's not a biosimilar metal. So this was the only example of ideal biosimilar metal we had, but it turns out it isn't in reality. Other well-known biosimilar metals like the cobaltine sulfide they are not ideal in the sense that uh, in addition to the bio nodes at the firm level, we have other bands crossing the firm level as well. And that might cause leaking and prevents the tunneling magnetic resistance effect to be large as predicted 
uh, from the model calculations. And here's how it goes. Okay, so in the ideal ISM method, we only have these bio bands, and in the interparallel configuration, I have that chirality uh, mechanism that prevents electrons from tunneling while conserving their momentum. But if I have a non-ideal biosemi metal, I can have other bands crossing the from level like this one. And these other bands, they do not have necessarily well-defined chirality. So I can have other pieces of the firm surface also contributing, contributing to tunneling, which uh, will raise up the tunneling current that I might get in the anti-parallel configuration, reducing uh, the size of the TMR in these systems. So one of the biggest challenges here is to find ideal biosimilar metals to realize that. This is something that I'm trying to do. So I'm trying to find systems which have ideal properties so I can propose to for experimental uh, realization of this. But so far, this is extremely difficult to find. I have no success at all. So uh, just to summarize, so again, this was mainly a talk about only magnet resistance effect. Uh, the most well-known approach is to only magnet resistance effect, which is the conventional approach, is that uh, in which case you compare the density of states on opposite sides of the barrier for the full magnet, not a momentum resolved density of states, and the tunneling barrier plays an important role in filtering states. Okay, and that has been really useful. Uh, in spintronics, and it is the reason why we have uh, MBRAMs nowadays. But the modern approaches, uh, which come from those uh, specific magnetic properties of emerging classes of materials, they rely on a momentum result uh, way of looking at this uh, tunneling transition points. Here I have the example of ultramagnets, which is a very prominent example of this. And the one that I proposed, which is a biosimilar metal, which uh, is still to be realized in uh, uh, experimentally. Okay. So with that, I'm done. So I'll be happy to answer any questions or any comments you might have. Thank you very much.